Les humains à leur meilleur. C'est toi pour Héo. Gabor is a food scientist with a master's in molecular biology. He lives in Hungary and is one of these engineers slash scientists who I love talking to who look at nutrition differently. He has a very unique perspective because he works for a big food manufacturer that makes sugary syrups that he believes are harmful. It's a rare point of view. He spends almost all of his free time researching this stuff to help people understand how bad these processed foods actually are. He has a large community on Facebook where he shares and discusses this information. He also has some great presentation he's done you can find online. We recorded past midnight and I was losing steam at the end and didn't continue the conversation much. He was talking about a really interesting topic though, the adipocentric model of diabetes. For a long time, many people have been talking about the insulin carbohydrate model of diabetes. There's a lot to this subject and we'll get more into it in the coming weeks. I have already recorded an episode covering more of this that will come out next week. It's basically flipping our thoughts of insulin resistance around. The problems occur when you eat more than your personal fat threshold can take, whether it be carbs, fat, or protein. So the problem is your adipose tissue can't properly store all the lipids. People start becoming insulin resistant because of their obesity or overstuffed and inflamed fat cells instead of becoming obese from the insulin resistance. This may be super boring and esoteric to some, but for others it'll be super interesting. I personally am very into it. There's a couple weeks left to support the Food Lies film on Indiegogo. Thanks so much. We couldn't do it without you. Listener and crowd support is the only thing powering this film and podcast right now, so I really appreciate it. Now please listen to the wise words of Gabor Idrosi. All right, Gabor, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Uh, where are you calling in from? Yeah, thanks for inviting. I'm uh, calling in from Hungary. That's in Central Europe. For those uh, not knowing, it's a small country, so it, it can happen. Great. Well, yeah, I, I saw some online presentations you did, and they're really interesting. So I wanted to have you on, and I really like the way you think. You come at it from a different angle. A lot of people are doctors, or they're, you know, they go their whole life in the medical system, and they think about the body in a certain way. And you, you, know, you study, I know you have a master's in molecular biology, but you didn't go into medicine. And so I think your hobby is to just read papers and think about all this stuff. And you've come up with a lot of interesting things. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, indeed. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a hobby for me. Um, I've never been in an academy or, or, or medicine formally. So um, actually, I've been working in and with the, the food industry mainly and, and mm. uh, other industries with similar scopes. So um, yeah, it's almost 100% uh, a hobby. Some parts, uh, for example, starch uh, processing and starch degradation by enzymes, that's been my professional interest also. But uh, the, the, the health aspects are mainly my hobby. Well, I guess you could say it's my hobby too because I don't make any money off this really. <laughs> and you're just presenting information. So yeah, I like all the research you've done and you use all these scientific papers and we will link to them all in the show notes. And, and can you say you know, what type of work you do in the food industry or I don't know how specific you can be? Well, um, I used to work in uh, uh, the food biotechnology, kind of uh, working with uh, different food processors on optimizing their processes from the biotechnology perspective. And uh, recently, uh, I've been working in um, in the food industry itself and uh, producing different uh, syrups from uh, mainly corn. Mm, that's so, uh, kind that's... of ironic because I know you don't believe in eating them much. Yeah, I, th I think uh, these are part of most uh, processed foods, so so put into almost uh, everything. And I kind of uh, provide technical support for for the sales department uh, when they want to substitute sugar or they want to offer uh, improved recipes and, and these kind of things. So I, I have a, quite a good uh, understanding of how the um, processing of different foodstuffs goes and, and uh, how the industry formulates uh, recipes and what the main reasons are behind these. But, but this is not really used in my 
scientific perspective it's, it's not very important i, I just uh, stop and think a little bit when people say that the, the food industry is evil and uh, they would like to poison people and these kind of things i i don't think that's actually the the, the case yeah. they just yeah. want to make profit and the highest profit possible so they they want to optimize their processes uh, reduce costs and so on and yeah. uh, but but definitely that has an impact on the health outcomes or the, the healthfulness of different foodstuffs yeah, but uh, generally, said. they are not after people so that they can uh, poison them. Yeah, that would make sense because then they couldn't feed them more stuff and make more money. <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah, it's an unintended consequence and the demand's there. The problem is that the demand's there. And some of the problem is the advertising and it's just our modern society. There's nothing much we can do at this point. It, it exists. All these processed foods and fast foods exist and the demand's there. So the yeah, only but, thing we uh, can you, do... you, can al- you can always argue why there is that demand is it well yeah choose people have to choose to not do it but yeah what why do you think yeah what what has driven this demand it's, it's really interesting stuff and uh, i'm not really into politics including including food and, and health politics but uh, i believe that politics has to do a lot with uh, where we are now with respect to this processed food dumping we have well, yeah. You talk about in your presentation about there's a market increase in the 80s when the dietary guidelines came out and the amount of processed foods. And Well, let's get into the presentation because you talk about how specifically the processing of foods matters, like the actual act of grinding down foods. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I was asked sometime last year to give a presentation on... Um, food processing, the effects of food processing on health outcomes and metabolic responses. And um, yeah, I, I tried to prepare. I had something like 35 minutes. So I tried to squeeze into what, what I could. But still, uh, a lot of things were, were left out by necessity because uh, I couldn't touch upon, for example, the effect of using seed oils uh, oh, yeah, because that's, that, that's, a, that's a whole different uh, story. And, and I tried to focus on short-term metabolic responses, you know. Yeah. So, so not uh, some foodstuffs have, have a long-term effect. And, and I think uh, seed oils uh, go there because they include a lot of uh, oxidized lipids. And these oxidized lipids are not really nice for your cardiovascular system, for your heart and, and arteries. And for this reason, I had to leave this out completely. But uh, there are other aspects not included in my presentation. So the main focus of this talk was differences in the short-term metabolic response to different foods. So how processing influences these and uh, as you could see, there is a big difference. There can be a big difference based on processing. Yeah. And I, I did a whole podcast with Tucker Goodrich about omega-6 seed oils and all that. And that, yeah, that's a huge problem. But this short-term stuff is really interesting. And the first line of your presentation was the speed and location of nutrient absorption in intestines determine metabolic outcomes. The speed yeah, that, that, that's, and the that's basically the, the final conclusion that when processing plants, especially plants, the difference between unprocessed and highly processed plant materials is the speed of absorption of nutrients, mainly glucose and, and sugars. And this speed also determines where these nutrients are absorbed within your small intestines. And uh, funnily enough, uh, if you understand the anatomy and physiology of your gastrointestinal digestive system, then uh, it turns out that we are not really designed to deal with this difference. We are designed to accept uh, whole foods going down into our system and stimulating different uh, receptors, different sensors all along the tube, the, the system. And this is what actually this won't happen when you eat refined carbohydrates, for example. Uh, there is a huge imbalance in the stimulation of these uh, sensors. So when people say don't eat processed foods, that's not just like some hippie thing from San Francisco from the 70s, you know, your aunt saying that type of thing. It's just evolution, right? Yeah, well, basically what drove me to, to this angle was that kind of everybody keeps saying that uh, don't eat processed foods and processed carbohydrates are, are harmful, but nobody says why and how. 
And I, as a molecular biologist, I'm always interested in the mechanisms, the underlying mechanisms. I'm, I'm, I'm not really interested in associations, what you see from epidemiological studies, from, from observations. So, for example, people are followed for a couple of years and those who eat uh, more white bread have a little bit worse outcomes than those uh, who eat brown and, and whole grain or whole rye breads, for example. So there, there are these comparisons, pure observations, and you just cannot know what, what happens with these people. And, and I'm quite honestly, I'm not satisfied with this kind of science. I, I would like to understand how the system works, first of all, because if you don't understand how physiology, healthy physiology, it's impossible to spot the differences in disease. Mm -hmm. And first I go into basic research, basic physiology research. I don't trust textbooks anymore, for example. So I go back to basic research in physiology and then um, try to put together the pieces, how the system may work. And after that, uh, examine the interaction of, of this uh, system with the environment. In this case, I, I went into gastrointestinal physiology how the digestive system works. And then uh, I um, just went and, and, and examined how food interacts with the digestive system and what are the, how the sensors work, how we sense nutrients in the bowel and how these sensors uh, forward uh, different signals. For example, I was mainly into the hormonal aspect and then how these uh, gut hormones stimulate islet hormones. So within your pancreas, you know, insulin and glucagon, these hormones and how this metabolic response is working in, in, in the system, in the body. Yeah, it's so interesting. So you talked about the hormones are released in different parts of the intestines. And you talk about GIP. Yeah, it turned, it turned out that there are sensors in your gut. And quite interestingly, and that's the next part of my interest, kind of. So I've been reading into this lately. These sensors uh, work not only for nutrients, but also for bacteria pathogens and signals, different signals from bacteria, like metabolites, the chemical compounds uh, bacteria release, good or bad, th these can be a huge number of compounds. So these sensors are not distributed evenly along the intestines. And, and this is very important to recognize because it has major implications in how the body perceives different uh, signals from food. Yeah, that's what most of the presentation is about. There's different sensor cells and different hormones are released based on those nutrients. And there's the upper intestine and the, the lower yeah, intestine. Yeah, uh, inadvertently, my presentation is a bit simplified. Even though people say that it's too technical, they have to watch two or three times to get all the messages. <laughs> Sorry for that. But I think it's after reading years and, and hundreds of papers about this, I feel it's a, it's a bit simplified. And some, some level of simplification is kind of unavoidable. So I try to use a special perspective and, and show people that you can actually view things from, from a different perspective. And instead of using all these associations uh, from, from observations, let's try to use a, a very different angle, kind of a bottom-up angle, and try to put together how the, the different foodstuffs interact with our bodies. It's a lot more useful approach. Okay, well, let's do the simplified version because we don't even have visuals <laughs> yeah. over here on our podcast, so it has to be ultra simplified. But yeah, so so let's imagine that uh, you have basically two kinds of sensors in your intestines. So you have a long tube, and then you have a distribution of uh, one of the sensors as a uh, funnel, and the other one as a funnel upside down. I think this is kind mm -hmm. of a good uh, visuals. Most people can hopefully imagine. So mm -hmm. there, is a, there is an interlap between the two, but one type of the sensors is much more abundant in the upper intestines and the other one in the lower. And actually what I noticed was that these sensors uh, should be or designed to be stimulated quite evenly. And, and that means that you, you should eat foodstuff that first stimulates the upper part of the small intestines and then later stimulates the lower part of the small intestine. And, and hopefully there is something remaining for your large intestines for the billions of bacteria or trillions mm -hmm. of bacteria living there as well. 
So, so yeah, just to cut in, so that's we're just talking about the small intestine where all this happens. And then what's a spoiler? The, the foods that do that, the foods that we were designed to eat, right, for the most amount of time, just to give yeah, away. If, that, if you yeah. hunt and eat a piece of meat, for example, and then if you gather some food, uh, some tubers or some berries, for example, these all are foodstuffs which properly stimulate these sensors, both the upper and, and the lower ones. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I recognize that uh, interestingly, when you eat, for example, fine ground wheat or starch, any any flour, but there are differences between different uh, grains and flours. But if you eat fine ground starch and cook it, there is a huge difference in the, the distribution of uh, how this stimulates your sensors. And, mm-hmm. and it turns out that it gives uh, such a huge imbalance in stimulation that the following hormonal responses are also hugely imbalanced. Yes. So do you want to talk about specific studies? I mean, you started out with some just like cooked versus non-cooked foods. and or like- I wanted to exclude some of the kind of confounders here because you often hear that, okay, what is processing? What is food processing? Humans have been processing their food for hundreds of thousands of years. And then uh, they can kind of wipe your arguments away mm-hmm. with this, that processing is, cooking is processing. Yeah, cooking has an effect. Obviously, you can observe or you can find from nicely conducted uh, studies that uh, cooking has an effect, even though cooking is not doesn't have a major effect on, on this one. Mm-hmm. So what you see is that cooking influences um, the digestibility of uh, food, the nutrient extraction, energy extraction. So those people uh, that eat raw foods tend to be a little bit slimmer, but Mm -hmm. well within the normal ranges. So statistically, you don't see a huge uh, difference between these. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that cooking is not a a major component in in this one. Mm -hmm. And then I went on and, and tried to have a look at how processing proteins and fats influences metabolic responses. And it turns out that even if you prehydrolyze, kind of pre-digest proteins into individual amino acids, it has an effect. It, it happens a bit quicker. So what you see is a slightly increased insulin and uh, incretin. Incretins are the, the hormones secreted by the sensors in, in your intestinal wall. So there, there are some small increases, but nothing dramatic happens. And barely anything happens with regard to fats. Mm-hmm. Uh, put aside the oxidation if you cook vulnerable fats at very high temperatures. And of course, you can burn your meat and then you have some carcinogen compounds developing. But uh, these are not short-term metabolic effects. Mm-hmm. So so uh, what you see is that when you process whatever you can do, grind, cook, even prehydrolyze your proteins and, and uh, cook your fats, the effect on metabolic responses is, is small. So these... Mm-hmm obviously cannot be behind any problems caused within the 20th century. So, yeah, so I went on... Yeah, major problems going on. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so I went on and, and then uh, had a look at so-called carbohydrates. Again, carbohydrates is not a homogeneous group. It's, it's just a kind of combining name for, for a lot of different uh, compounds. Mm-hmm. But when we talk about carbohydrates, we mainly talk about uh, starches and sugars. So I I had a look at how, for example, starchy plant processing influences metabolic responses or what happens when you when you process sugary plants, mainly mainly fruits. And yeah, you can check those slides. What happens when you juice apples, for example? So there is a huge difference between eating a whole apple and drinking whole apple juice. And again, all the nutrients is included in, in the apple juice used in the test. So they juice the whole apple. Yeah, you don't get rid of the pulp. No, the the, the fiber is in. in. The fiber is kept in. All the nutrients are kept in. And that's why I'm very skeptical about using the labels on processed foodstuffs. Because Mm, you can list and you can add back whatever you want. And it won't be the same because you miss the structure. And the structure has a very big importance in the metabolic responses. Well, that's basically the whole ending conclusion is that keeping the plant structure together is key. Yes. Uh, What you see is that glucose, blood glucose response after juicing the apple is uh, much higher. And insulin response is also much, much higher when you juice the apple compared to eating the the whole apple. 
And one more important thing I just point out several times during my presentation is that after these exaggerated hormonal and, and glucose responses, it's, it's mainly due to the huge insulin response, you see a dive in blood sugar. So you have a huge dip well below yeah, base, below baseline. Base, yeah. yeah, and this is uh, very strongly associated with hunger. Kind of when the level of nutrients, the level of uh, available fuels in your blood drop very quickly and below a certain level, you always feel hungry. It's, it's not a kind of a regular hunger which you develop after, I don't know, five, six, eight hours of eating. It's a, it's a quick thing. Your, your blood sugar drops very quickly and your brain is kind of in an al alarm and uh, you, you just feel hungry. And, and it was shown in very different studies. Same with starch processing when you eat white flour, bread and similar things and you do not add other foodstuffs that slow the digestion of these, then you see the same. Very quick uh, blood glucose drop after the huge insulin response and hunger. And th these are confirmed by measuring subjective hunger feelings in some studies. So it's, it's absolutely there. Yeah, yeah. Th at the same time, the exact same time. Yes, yes. and, 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 and actually in drop. some studies they measured uh, ghrelin. It's called the hunger hormone released yeah. by your stomach. And this ghrelin just surges exactly at the same time. So you see this dip in blood glucose after the huge spike and following insulin response. And you have this dip in blood glucose and a surge in ghrelin, the hunger hormone. So you can see the physiology underlying what people often say that they are carbohydrate addicts because when you eat carbohydrates, you have this hunger every two, three hours. And this is not about carbohydrates. This is extremely quick absorbing carbohydrates. This is about the refined carbs. And so, yeah, that's when you're ending yeah. up hungry yeah. and, and snacking and then, again. Yeah. And then you realize that some of the science uses some kind of markers like glycemic index, glycemic load, the fiber mm -hmm. content. And then you realize that mechanistically, these do not say much. So these are just proxies. I like to say these are proxies for something else. And the something else is lacking plant structure. So uh, that's what you see when you examine the role of fiber. So removing fiber is obviously disrupting structure. Mm -hmm. And then what you see with glycemic index, how high your blood glucose goes after a meal. The mechanism underlying is that if you remove structure, it goes very high. If you don't remove structure, it's normal. So these are proxies and that's why when you use them in observational studies, when you ask a lot of people, or not only ask, but you record data more meticulously, you have the data of what they eat, actually. Uh, but still, if you use proxies, your results will be yeah, screwed, quite honestly. So, so that's why you don't have consistent data in, in these observational studies. When you use glycemic index, glycemic load, uh, fiber, you usually still have beneficial outcomes when you compare people eating a lot of fiber, that usually means that they do not add back fiber to their meals, but they eat whole foods, whole yeah, food items. which is obviously better. So if you process a food, grind it up, and then add back in fiber, it doesn't help, right? You already destroyed the structure. Yeah, it's a, the simple message is that it won't help much. The, the not so simple message is that uh, there are differences between fibers. And obviously, some fibers can bind a lot of water, and swell and those fibers that can bind a lot of water and swell they still have some benefit when you add them back because mm -hmm. they increase uh, the volume and they swell up and they slow the gastric emptying so how fast uh, the food leaves your stomach so what fibers are those i think that the psyllium husk for example is a good example mm -hmm. some of the beta glucans can can bind a lot of water yeah but don't don't expect the same effect when you have these in their whole food structure or, or plant structure, but you can st still see some benefit. So this, mm -hmm. this is the basic message that fibers as a group is also not a homogeneous one. So it's a diverse, uh, a huge number of molecules and, and, um, and it's a diverse group. So you can convey a simplified message. Yeah, adding back fiber usually won't help, but sometimes it, it could to some extent. Yeah, but I guess a simplified message would be be safe and just eat whole foods. Yeah, the simplified yeah. message is always uh, better because you can reach more people. I mean, obviously, if you have a deep understanding of uh, how these things work, then you can uh, kind of hack your feeding patterns. Mm -hmm. So you, mm -hmm. you can have some workarounds. And, uh, but uh, if you don't 
understand these things at the level as I do, or, or even deeper, than just follow a few simple principles. And that was basically the conclusion of my presentation, that eating animal foods is uh, safer from this respect, because these are mainly made up of uh, protein and fat. And obviously, processing protein and fat won't result in that uh, huge exaggerated metabolic response. Of course, you shouldn't eat very badly processed meats and, and don't burn your meat. And there are many additional comments or advices that can be added. But the, the basic message is that it's safer to eat animal foods and then eat minimally processed plant foods. You can even eat plant-based diet if you, you know what you are doing. Well, the bioavailability, I don't know if we should get into that now, but there's a way different Yeah, that's, bioavailability. That's, a, that's a whole different story. But quite obviously, if you compare typical modern processed crap to whole plant foods, you will see a big difference. So no doubt, I'm not talking about optimal nutrition for humans. Uh, that's a very long discussion, and I'm not <laughs> sure I, I could even give useful comments on that one. But just talking about common sense and on what you can do easily, for example. So, so I went into a few other aspects, like the order of foods, what you should eat first, and what uh, you, I think the size is very clear. There was another study published uh, past August about this. Uh, you should eat your carbohydrates, especially if you are eating quicker absorbing carbohydrates. You should eat them at the end of your meat. So eat your vegetables, meats, and, the meal. and yeah. fat first and, and, uh, and add the carbohydrates last. That's very important. Eat slowly. The, the science is also clear that eating more slowly, even ice cream, results in a more beneficial hormonal profile. So uh, we just can, having more time to have yeah yeah it. just eat eat slowly enjoy your meal and and then that also helps and then yeah some other factors you can find in my presentation but there's a few other ones I wanted to bring up in the presentation I thought it was really interesting when you looked at the mice the rodent study where the scientists gave them a high fat and sugar diet and they got obese compared to the rat chow but then they grinded the normal rat chow and they got just as obese. Yeah, uh, that shows that what the basic problems are. I mean, there are <laughs> there are many problems with rodent uh, trials. So yeah. obviously, uh, researchers try to use some standardized feeding, and this standardization is just uh, undermines uh, all the studies because uh, when, for example, they say that feed is high in uh, fat or high in sugar, usually it's high in both, but that doesn't really gives you the, the right message about what that food is. That food is completely synthetic. So mm -hmm. just what is a rodent high-fat diet? Most people don't understand this. High-fat diet consists of uh, some protein source, uh, usually casein from milk, so milk protein, and uh, it maltodextrins and cornstarch, so fully processed, and sugar and lard and soybean oil and vitamin complex and uh, mineral complex. And that's mm -hmm. it. So there is no real food within this yeah. package. There, there is nothing. The, the control chow is also not really nice food stuff for rodents, but at least it consists of whole grains and, and these kind of things. So it, it's very different. But it, it, it turns out that when you fine grind the control chow, what happens is that you see this exaggerated uh, metabolic response and then the little critters start to overeat the same way as they do on the, the so-called high fat and high sugar diet. So uh, yeah. there, there is something, I think there may be some difference between uh, human physiology or human diets and these research diets in rodents and how they work. Because in rodents, we, we have a quite a good understanding that these ultra refined, I like to call them synthetic foods or, or feeds completely disrupt the balance in, in the microbes in their large intestines, in, in their large bowels. And what happens is that they start releasing different compounds, which their body senses as uh, this biosis. So they sense that there is an infection or there is a big problem in, in the digestive system. Some bacteria must have overgrown very uh, severely. And, uh, then they have a response kind of a sepsis, you know, when you have a mm -hmm. huge uh, infection or contamination by bacteria. And what you see is an immune response with elevated insulin. And then when you have this immune response with elevated insulin, they start overeating only after that. So it doesn't start with overeating, it starts with the elevated insulin, and then they start overeating. 
and then they develop obesity and then they develop diabetes and so on and so on. That sounds like it's very plausible for what happens in humans. Yeah, um, we don't know. I don't think actually that it works this, absolutely the same way because what was shown in rodents, both in mice and, and rats, was that they have an imbalance in their uh, large intestines and that imbalance results in continuous high levels of acetate, acetic acid. And this chronic high acetate signals the dysbiosis, the, the problem from their large intestines and that's what they, their bodies feel as, as, a, as a huge problem and, and launch the immune response. And I think in humans it has most likely more to do with small intestinal permeability so so disruption of the gut barrier and, and not with the mm. colonic uh, overgrowth of, of some bacteria that there is there are changes of course but but it seems that uh, in humans it's it's probably uh, a little bit different and you have this kind of leaky gut problem and that can launch a very similar immune response if nothing else than a low level chronic inflammation inflammatory state okay so it's bad it's just a little different and can you talk more about the leaky gut and gut permeability because you know a lot of people talk about that lately and the problems with eating grains yeah, and certain it, plant foods in general i took the same approach as with all systems examined previously so i had a look at what we know about healthy physiology and, and anatomy so how the barrier function works, how our intestinal wall tries to maintain the homeostasis so that uh, only things cross that are intended to and no bacterial parts and no definitely no whole bacteria and, and uh, harmful compounds cross this barrier. Uh, this is again a kind of a small simplification because our immune system continues to sample the bacteria within the intestines within the digestive system. So there is always some leaking, so to say, but it's intentional. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in fact, there are some scenarios when our body purposefully opens up this barrier function so that it can have some inflammatory stuff to launch inflammation in some circumstances. That's very interesting. Um, for Good example, inflammation for a specific reason? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, when you have a um, strong pressure from a bad diet or, or you're just overeating for fun and you, your adipose tissue has to expand, your fat cells have to proliferate and uh, you need to add some more fat, then uh, for healthy fat expansion, it seems that you need kind of an inflammatory response within your adipose tissue. And how to create inflammation in the body purposefully, it's, uh, it's very difficult. It sounds very difficult, but the, how the system may work, it seems that it opens up a little bit these uh, tight junctions between the epithelial cells in the, in the intestines and some bacteria and some lipopolysaccharides. These, these are molecules from the bacterial wall. These enter the system and these help with the macrophages, the Im large immune cells in the fat tissue to be differently polarized. So they take up, in instead of an anti-inflammatory uh, setup, they take up uh, an inflammatory profile and then they help the tissue to expand in a, in a healthy way so that there are more blood vessels are added and there is proper uh, extracellular so so the um, connective tissue expands together with uh, fat cells so you see a healthy expansion after all mm. what happens when it goes wrong so people with autoimmune disease yeah so i think is... uh, in most chronic diseases what you see is that there is a healthy acute response so acute meaning temporary mm -hmm. so there is there is something which is normal in the short term but which can be abnormal if it persists uh, in the long run yeah so yeah, this I mean, is called in, in medicine it's called acute that's the temporary and chronic when it persists mm -hmm. so in, in most modern chronic diseases what you see is that there are some pathways which just somehow remain in this uh, chronically stimulated state so you see this unresolved uh, inflammation for example and I believe this is absolutely key to so many diseases like cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, and of course, uh, autoimmune diseases as well. And this is what happens. You see this uh, unresolved inflammation because the stimulus continuously persists. Mm. Okay. Some people just genetically 
Some people get autoimmune diseases really early on. What happens in in that? Yeah, uh, just a disclaimer. I do have an autoimmune disease, which mm. uh, was just diagnosed a few years ago, but uh, I recognize that it, it has been going on for, for decades, basically. And um, yeah, you asked this question. What did I do wrong? So what, what happened? Why me? Is it genetics or, or is it not genetics? And I think, uh, and I studied a lot of genetics, so uh, officially I'm kind of a geneticist or, or whatever. But mm -hmm. I still uh, realize that genetics is just influences the landscape. So what happens is that you have this very poor environmental pressure, or very strong and, and, and a bad type of environmental pressure, and then eventually your body just uh, gives in. And I think most autoimmune diseases are strongly connected to the gut permeability, the leaky gut uh, problem mm -hmm. we just uh, discussed. And in, in my case, for example, that there is an enzyme, a starch breakdown enzyme, but bacteria produces this enzyme in, in, in the gut when it meets starch. And if you have a, let's say, leaky gut for uh, simplification, parts of this enzyme can enter your bloodstream. And what it turns out that some parts of this enzyme, it's a long protein chain. Every enzyme is a long protein chain. So what you see is some amino acid sequence. One part of this enzyme is very, very similar to a sequence of the human collagen. And then your immune system mixes up the two and starts attacking uh, not only these uh, leaking bacterial protein parts, but also the collagen, which is very, very similar to, mm, to, yeah. to it. So this is what uh, happens, I believe, in, in most autoimmune diseases. Of course, bacterial parts can come from, for example, urinary infections or from cavities in your teeth. It's, it's, not, only, it's not exclusively your intestines your digestive system where, where bacteria parts can leak into your own body. Mm -hmm. So it can be uh, many other places, but I think the vast, vast majority happens through your intestinal walls. And that's why it's very important to maintain uh, a healthy gut barrier. And uh, yeah, as it turns out, uh, those sensors that are located in your distal, the lower intestines, release hormones that maintain this gut barrier. Isn't it interesting? So mm -hmm. when you when you provide proper uh, stimulation, more difficult to digest foods, then uh, you better maintain your your intestinal barrier function mm -hmm. as well. So, so it's it's not only the short term metabolic responses, but also long term uh, intestinal health barrier function. So to keep a healthy gut wall or lining, are you saying just to eat foods that we've been eating for all of history? Now, you can eat a combination of animal and plant foods and still uh, maintain a healthy barrier because, uh, I mean, ancient plant foodstuffs, I mean, pre-agricultural foodstuffs are definitely fall into this uh, category. So I think most people can eat plants. If you have an autoimmune disease, you have to see uh, how you react to different foods. What I usually recommend to people that you go carnivore for four or five weeks that's kind of a gut reset. When, when, you, when you change your diet so substantially, for example, when going carnivore, your microbiome, your microbiota, the, the composition of bacteria and uh, fungi in, in your intestines also changes very profoundly. And I call it, uh, I like to call it a gut reset. Mm -hmm. So you do this gut reset by going carnivore and then you start adding back different foodstuffs. I also recommend that for this four or five weeks, dairy is left out as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then you can start adding back uh, different foodstuffs and one by one. And then you, you'll be able to see if this kind of food, for example, dairy or that kind of food, for example, leafy vegetables or, or non-leafy vegetables, nightshades and some kind of grains or some types of fruit fit into your gut health or, or, or not. You will see the responses and you can decide, okay, I, I don't really react. I don't really seem to react. Yeah, I, quite, I, did it, yeah. I did it for myself and, and it's relatively easy because mechanistically, my kind of autoimmune disease is already connected to high starch consumption. So by excluding almost all starches from my diet, I haven't been taking any drugs, uh, any anti-inflammatory or or any kind of uh, drugs anymore so i'm i've been drug free for at least uh, two years now 
to mm. the amusement of my rheumatologist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I must say that they are completely clueless with this regard. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, doctors bought into this mainstream stuff usually are. I've had some funny talks with my <laughs> just yeah, even a, a skin doctor. They just don't understand. They're just flabbergasted at things that I say. Yeah, I usually share this uh, personal story that at bedtime with the kids, we have some kind of a ritual so that I, I make their bed and make the blanket nice and, and smooth. And mm-hmm. one of the beds are kind of these high beds, you know. I used to be unable to throw up the blanket to the kid. Mm. So my back was uh, so severely stiff and hurt that I, I was not able to throw up the blanket. And then every time, every evening when I'm at home and part of this ritual, I'm remembered that, okay, it's so easy without any problem, no, no pain. So I'm reminded every evening when I'm at home that uh, I manage this condition with lifestyle and, and uh, absolutely no drugs. That's great. Yeah. So yeah, that's called the elimination diet. I guess people call it when you go down. Yeah, to yeah. Just, I, you know. I did try carnivore uh, and I added back uh, different foodstuffs. I eat yeah. uh, very little vegetables. It seems that I'm sensitive to these uh, FODMAPs, you know, these uh, fructo oligosaccharides mm-hmm. and different plant compounds. So what I, leave, uh, what I have to leave out is uh, basically all starch and all high FODMAP plants. I basically eat animal foods and some fruits. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, for some people, they have a certain disease. So it's not like everyone has to do that. It sounds like just don't be eating highly processed food is the general recommendation. And then if you have some problems, then check some other foods and maybe do an elimination diet. But someone like me, it seems like I can eat most whole foods and do totally fine. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely depends on where you start from. So if you if you are what I like to say already metabolically deranged, like you have severe insulin resistance or or you are straight uh, type two diabetic, that it makes sense to remove most carbohydrates from your diet. Mm-hmm. That's kind of I see it as inevitable. Some people do the opposite and they uh, leave out all fats and they report that it works to some extent. And I believe there is a physiological reason why these extremely low fat diets also work. But uh, I also find that for most people, it's a lot more difficult to stay on a diet which is extremely low in fat because you have to go really, really low. It's not like a government recommended uh, yeah, like low 30%. fat diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, yeah, no. It's, it's below 10%. Yeah, definitely. I, yeah, I talk about this a lot is it does work. Vegans like to point this out or different modern hunter gatherers live in this way with very low fat diets. But what do you think that mechanism is? What is that physiology? I'm always curious about that. I think there are two aspects. Uh, one is if you leave out the fat, then you eliminate the need for, I like to say, partitioning fuels, because that's what insulin does, in my opinion, in the body. It partitions fuels and, and nutrients. So you a- eliminate the need, and that way you can achieve high level of uh, partitioning with low levels of insulin. And basically, that's what you want. Uh, low levels of insulin in in your body. So you can achieve low levels of insulin uh, with an extremely low fat diet. If you don't mix carbohydrates and fats, then it's it's always beneficial. Yeah. I watch vegan videos from doctors and try to figure out what's going on with them. So I am not just one-sided. And yeah, they show that if you have low fat enough, they show the graphs and that you can eat a piece of bread and you won't get a high insulin spike. Yeah. But I find these types of foods personally absolutely unpalatable so yeah um, um, i mean if i can eat a good back back bacon or a, or a nice steak uh, with some berries uh, i find this fantastic food if i should subsist on on leaves and flowers and these stalks and this kind of uh, grains <laughs> Ah, uh, sorry. No, 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 thanks. <laughs> yeah, that. I mean, exactly. That's why I don't think anyone can really pull off that diet. No, you I have mean, to be. Yeah, well, if it you works have to be for you. in modern America, I don't think. Yeah, if it works for you, eating leaves and stalks and flowers, you are in the seventies eating flowers, and uh, then do so. I'm, I'm, I'm not absolutely not against it. So if it works for you, you find it palatable, you enjoy your meals, and you reach your goals. Definitely, well, just, just follow it. Well, I, I think that there's a problem with bioavailability and a problem with getting enough protein. I, I just think that people need to get adequate protein. Yeah, you, you have to be smart if you go straight vegan. 
nobody should do, I think. You can be very low fat without leaving out. Oh, you're right. Yeah. I, um, of course. Yes. I, I did talk about that. If you eat these really nutrient dense, lean proteins, you can eat like liver and oysters and stuff like that. And well, even just skinless chicken, although yeah. there's not much nutrients in it. But that's, that's exactly the reason why I gave out these simplified recommendations at the end of my presentation, because I recognize that if you have to be smart about what you eat, then it's, it's not the right diet. So if you have to be smart and understand what this food stuff will do in my system and what I have to combine so that I have all yeah. essential nutrients and so on, then, then that's, that, that's not, not the right diet. And that's the same problem with veganism. So you have to make sure that you, how you get your protein, how you get your vitamin B12, your omega-3s and so on. No, no, no. I mean, just eat some lean fish and then you have your omega-3s <laughs> and, and forget yeah. about all the other stuff. Exactly. If you need a spreadsheet just to maintain decent health, then that's not good. Sure. So the problem is the high fat and the high sugar at the same time. That's the killer combo. And you mentioned that in your presentation and show a couple slides about that, eating a mixed diet, eating a meal of just a sandwich, like you have the meat and then the butter and the bread. And individually, they don't cause a problem. But when they're eaten together, that's when the problems arise. Yeah, basically, ultra refined carbohydrates can cause a problem alone. So that's also a call yeah. uh, oh, yeah. that, that all vegans and, and vegetarians should understand that even if you go low fat and, and eat only plant foods, ultra refined carbohydrates can still cause a problem. Most likely not to, to the extent when you combine it with, with fats, but, uh, but still. Yeah, the really bad thing happens when you eat these refined carbohydrates together with fats. That's the worst. Mm -hmm. That's the worst for, for sure. Well, well, what's the mechanism? What's going on there? Why is that bad? Yeah, it turns out that the same sensors we, we've been talking about sense also fats, and fats are easily digested. It feels a little bit differently, but uh, mechanistically, it easily digested. You need some bile acids, and then you need to absorb. There is not much to do, just one or two enzymes to hydrolyze and, and then absorb when they are added to these bile acids. So, uh, And then for this reason, they are absorbed mainly in the upper small intestines. And then that's the same problem of triggering the same uh, receptors and then uh, triggering the same hormonal responses. So what you see, you have this uh, upper intestinal hormone, GIP. And uh, when you eat refined carbohydrates, there is a big spike in this hormone. And when you add fat on top, you have a huge spike of this hormone. And, and at the same time, the lower intestinal hormones remain the same low. So you just have an exaggerated uh, response when you combine But the then two. what if you just have fat and protein? Do you still have that? You're saying that it still has that same mechanism. Uh, that's fat, fat and protein together slows down gastric emptying, so you you feel full for a longer period of time. Yeah, the high then, satiety. Yeah, 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 and the, and the content is released uh, slowly, and then uh, together with the protein, it will uh, stimulate also lower intestinal uh, receptors. And uh, you get a much more balanced, much more balanced. And then and, and you don't see this exaggerated when you don't combine the two. Mm. Well, what, you know, there's a theory of insulin and in that if you're eating the fat and the sugars together, that it, the problem is that with the partitioning and the insulin is storing away because of the sugar, it's storing away the fat. Is that also going on, you think? Or are you mainly just talking about what goes on in the intestine? Um, I think that these are directly connected. So when you examine these hormones, which we were talking about, the GIP and GIP1, these are so-called incretins. And incretins means that they stimulate your pancreas to release hormones, for example, to release insulin. And then the, the very interesting part is that uh, these two hormones stimulate glucagon differently. So GIP, the upper intestinal hormone, also stimulates glucagon for release. Mm. And the GIP1 at the same time suppresses glucagon. So they have opposing effects on glucagon, but the same effect on insulin. That's a very interesting setup if you think about it. Mm. And this is part of the problem because you create a insulin and glucagon imbalance if you stimulate these hormones in an imbalanced way. So it starts from the intestine, but goes on to islet hormones, insulin and glucagon and so on. And, and finally, these imbalances reach your most metabolically active organs, like your liver, your adipose tissue, and your muscles. And the final effect is always there. So there is a communication between your metabolically active organs all the time. And it seems that your adipose tissue is the latest addition evolutionarily to these organs. 
And it's kind of a master regulator of metabolism, especially the switch between the fasted and the fat state. So eating and not eating, that's the main role of your adipose tissues to kind of buffer, to balance out nutrient or fuel flows in your body. Yeah, yeah. So it has to take up uh, nutrients, especially lipids, after meals, and then it has to release when you haven't eaten for many hours so that you have uh, always a stable, very, very small fluctuation in your bloodstream. That's the role of your adipose uh, tissues, your, your fat stores, and that's the major role also for insulin to properly regulate that. Yeah. So also you talk about the timing and frequency and size of meals. Yeah, there are some very nice studies measuring the metabolic response differences between eating more smaller meals and eating fewer but larger meals. And uh, although, again, observational studies can show everything, <laughs> basically, sometimes you hear in the newspapers that eating a lot of small meals is beneficial, eating a lot of uh, huge meals is beneficial. You, you cannot really draw conclusions based on that. But if you base your meals on animal foods and just add some plants, then you definitely shouldn't eat continuously. I think you cannot even do that because you, yeah. are, you are not hungry. Naturally, you won't eat continuously. Yeah, yeah. It seems that uh, eating one to three meals daily is uh, the sweet point mm -hmm. where you would like to be if you eat this way. So um, the relative insulin response is lowest when you eat a large meal. And then now we yeah, are talking about uh, mixed meals and most people typically eat mixed meals. Oh yeah, keep going because and then, uh, it, was... It, it was it was measured even in diabetics that uh, when they eat five six uh, smaller meals, the overall insulin response over the day is significantly higher. Yeah, this is not what, what you saying. want for diabetics for, yeah. for different reasons for, for for several reasons. So diabetics definitely don't go and and uh, and graze. Uh, just eat two or, or three meals within a limited time frame during the day. Yeah, and that's another thing which, which is repeatedly shown to be beneficial. Uh, limit your feeding window to, I don't know, max 10 hours mm -hmm. and then have a long overnight fast of at least uh, 14 hours. That can do also wonders. Even without applying huge changes to what you eat, if you eat in a, in a shorter time window, then you can have a lot of beneficial effects. Yeah, I agree. Intermittent fasting or condensed eating windows are amazing. But but so what is the exact thing going on there? If you yeah, it seems us? that there is a, a physiological process called autophagy. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you heard about it. Yeah, yeah. And if you eat all the time over the day and only leave uh, six to eight hours, just basically you don't eat while you are sleeping, then uh, there is a chronic suppression of this uh, physiological process. And a lot of metabolic problems uh, are strongly associated with chronic suppression of uh, autophagy. So I, I think actually uh, we should leave time for the body to cope with the, the stress caused by feeding. Many people don't recognize it, but the biggest stress in our everyday lives is eating. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it always provides a metabolic stress and then you have to pause for half a day and don't eat. You don't yeah, have to okay. eat all the time. We are not designed for eating uh, continuously. That's the cause. <laughs> yeah, that or yeah, like our ancestors sitting in trees trying to get enough calories from leaves eating all day. Yeah. But that's not us. And I say the good stuff happens when you're not eating. Right? That's when the good things are happening. Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And some people uh, even prefer uh, longer fasting periods. So they just uh, skip a day or two, for example. And uh, depending on where you start from, uh, it can provide uh, additional benefits from time to time. And yeah. uh, of course, you can you can all the time you hear it from from the news that intermittent fasting is is not healthy because they observed in rats again in rats that uh, mm -hmm. alternate alternate day fasting caused some mild symptoms of diabetes for the rats. But come on, I mean, rats have a several fold faster metabolism than humans. Alternate oh, yeah. day fasting for a rat is something like stopping for, for four days and then eating for four days and stopping for four days and, and so <sighs> on for humans. So uh, that sounds unhealthy. That yeah. you, you eat for four days and then you stop for four days and then and, and for, for years doing that. So that's a too high uh, a stress. Yeah, that's and I crazy. agree, but that's that's for rats. Rats shouldn't be starved for 24 hours and then let them feed for 24 hours. And not to mention that it's also important what quality food you refeed on. 
I mean, if, if you give those rats the optimal food available, perhaps they can properly refeed in the 24 hours of their feeding window in this setting, mm -hmm. and then they don't experience that, that huge stress. But if you, if you only provide grains and, and the usual uh, red chow for 24 hours, they cannot properly refeed. Mm -hmm. And that's another problem. So it's a combination of not considering the difference in metabolic speed and then don't, not letting them properly refeed. So the, if you fast, always refeed properly, provide the best nutrient-dense foods for your body when you are eating. And then eat nothing when you are not eating. It's, it's not so difficult. Yeah, and it's so weird how the media tries to just counteract everything. <laughs> I guess they're trying to get clicks, but intermittent fasting is very normal, makes logical sense evolutionarily. We didn't always have food around. And like you said before, this is just how our bodies are designed, like with adipose tissue. Yeah, and doing a 8-16, I mean, 8 hours feeding window, 16 hours fasting window, it's even effortless basically. Oh, yeah. You can eat two, three meals, full, large meals in that eight hours, and then you are not even hungry. So you can easily live to, to the next day. It's effortless and you can reap the benefits uh, of, of fasting. Yeah, I agree. So you, you talk about gut permeability and gut health and all that kind of stuff. So obviously the microbiome is connected and it's also the hottest thing right now. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone has their own ideas, making it seem like it's the biggest thing ever. You know, I hear people talk about it like it's all that matters. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, I believe this area of science has been very quickly evolving lately. And, and, and I also believe that there are some very interesting developments. Um, at the same time, I believe that it's especially fascinating because we don't really understand the stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been looking into this lately and, and I've, I've always kept an eye on that. So I, I believe I read the, the most important studies, but it seems that diet is such a huge de determinant and uh, environment in, in general, uh, environmental input, but mainly diet is such a profound determinant of how the microbiome looks like in, in, in any given individual that anything other is uh, a little bit, I don't know how to say politely, but uh, it's, a, it's like a balloon. Uh, Everybody is pumping, it's a balloon and, and perhaps it will just, somebody will poke it with, with, a, with a new study anytime soon and, and uh, everybody will be very disappointed. Well, yeah, no, I think it, it's really important and there's a lot of things going on and people talk about the gut-brain ac axis and, you know, that's connected and stuff. But I think people go overboard when they say you need to have 100 billion species of, in your microbiome or that we look at correlations between, well, we'll look at someone who's healthy and then they're like, oh, well, they have, you know, one trillion species. So everyone has to have a trillion. But it seems like the gut biome that you have when you are healthy and you're eating healthy, that's what a good gut biome is, whatever it may be, right? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. There was a paper published in Nature, I think something like five years ago, which shows that diet introduces reproducible and profound changes to the gut biome in only two, three days. Mm -hmm. And uh, the changes they observed, basically they put participants on a carnivore or, or a plant-based, not, not a vegan, but a kind of a vegetarian diet, very high plant and, and limited amounts of, uh, of animals. And the other group was fully carnivore. I think they, they ate a lot of processed meats, but doesn't really matter from this perspective. But mm -hmm. what happened was that in, in two or three days, their microbiome changed very profoundly. Mm -hmm. And they analyzed all the strains, oh, I mean, the strains they, they were able to analyze. And it was impossible to draw firm conclusions based on that because the changes in the carnivore group were also kind of healthy changes. So what you saw was not a huge imbalance in a way that what you see in, in obese uh, and insulin-resistant people. It was different, but still looked like a healthy biome. And, and the same happened to the vegetarian or plant-based group. And then they switched. And again, in, in three days, it was completely different. The vegetarian group developed the, the carnivore biome and they were still healthy. Mm -hmm. And if you think, mm -hmm. if you stop for a moment and think about it from an evolutionary perspective, carnivores, I mean, carnivorous animals, they also have a biome, microbiota in their intestines. And they support the animal. So it's not like carnivores uh, have just a few really bad guys in their guts. Then they die uh, at a very young age because all, all yeah. these uh, bacteria just uh, eat them. No. What happens is that they also maintain a healthy microbiota. 
So carnivores have a healthy microbiota, herbivores have healthy microbiota, and omnivores have healthy microbiota. And there are some other publications which show that even though diet has a profound impact on your microbiota, you still have a general setup or line of strains that are characteristic of your ancestry. So a very interesting example is uh, pandas, you know, these guys uh, living on leaves, bamboo leaves in in China. And what do you think their microbiota looks like? Whatever it looks like when you're eating only one leaf. Yeah, you you would think so. Actually, they have a carnivore biome. Oh, really? Because that's their basic setup. They have an ancestry of carnivorism. Most bears are sometimes omnivores, but uh, carnivores, omnivores for sure. And uh, the basic setup of their microbiota is a carnivore biome with some adaptation to eating leaves. So this is this is really interesting. And I think uh, we have, uh, uh, including myself, but I, I'm sure that most people talking out loud about the microbiota out there have a very limited understanding of what's going on. And, and including myself, I mean, I've been looking into this. I have my own views, but I, I always have the feeling that I have a very limited understanding overall. So all the molecular mechanisms, the host and um, guest interactions, uh, you know, you see these reports or, or study or paper titles all the time that the microbiota regulates this and regulates that and controls this and controls that. And I love researchers who put it like this, that it modulates, because I, I don't actually think that the microbiota regulates and controls anything in our body. There is an interaction. Mm-hmm. There is an interaction. And, and uh, the host, for example, our human bodies are continuously interacting and, and actively regulating. So this is a two-way regulation. It's, it's not a one-way regulation. Our bodies release uh, different proteins, kind of disinfectants and microRNAs and and different stuffs that try to shift the balance in the microbiota strains actively. It's not a passive interaction. Both parties try to do what's best for them. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the end result is a mutually beneficial symbiotism, but uh, sometimes it's not, not the case. Yeah, well, I think that no one knows enough about it to make bold statements and then yeah, I try I, to just I think actually we know <laughs> we know a lot now from rodent models. So mm-hmm. we know a lot how mice microbiota interact with mice and of course there are a lot of similarities between different animals, but mice are evolutionarily quite distant to to humans. So it's uh, you should be very careful when when drawing conclusion or, or when extrapolating results to humans that oh this is how it works in in mice and then it must work the same way in humans i don't think so there are some very important differences yeah all right well why don't we talk about diabetes for a second we talked on the phone actually for a while last week which was cool and do you have some opinions on misunderstandings we have about diabetes Yeah, I I think uh, modern medicine is riddled with uh, symptomatic treatments. So your doctor is usually happy when you have an improvement in your symptoms, but doesn't really care about what's going uh, deep inside your body. So he or she just assumes that when you have some improvements in, in certain symptoms, that the underlying disease is also going better. And that's absolutely not necessarily the case. So um, what you see in connection with diabetes is that you have to have some kind of a blood sugar control and A1C control, so kind of a measure of a long-term blood sugar control. And if you have an acceptable blood sugar control, then your disease is also well under control. And that's absolutely not the case because uh, diabetes is technically not a disease of glucose, of blood sugar. It's, it's, It's just a symptom. So if you recognize the etiology of the disease, what goes wrong and uh, how it develops, what's the underlying mechanism, what are the underlying mechanisms, then blood sugar is not really a very important uh, symptom either. Um, There are some genetically kind of mutant people who have certain problems with, with certain enzymes and so on. And the end result is that they have an elevated baseline blood glucose. So in US terms, they have something like 30, 40 points higher. In in international terms, they have something like two points uh, higher blood glucose. That's the baseline. 
they always have mm-hmm. higher. And then the after feeding, it, it goes even higher. But otherwise, it's the same as for regular people. And it seems that as, as long as these people can avoid insulin resistance and diabetes, their life expectancy and health expectancy is the same as uh, for average people. So there is no, uh, no higher prevalence of cardiovascular disease, uh, no higher prevalence of microvascular disease associated with diabetes, for example, even though they are almost continuous, continuously in the diabetic range. So they start out as pre-diabetics. And then uh, all their adult life, they live as diabetics if you don't measure anything else. But in fact, they are not diabetics and and they don't show any of the uh, consequences of having diabetes. So then then what's the problem? Is it the blood sugar? Because these people have high blood sugar, at least significantly higher. And then they have uh, none of the associated problems. So what do you think is going on? I think that the, the uh, we mentioned it previously during this discussion that I believe that insulin's main role in the body is the partitioning of fuels and, and, and nutrients in general. Mm-hmm. So when you ha- when insulin fails to do so, that's when you have this metabolic disease we call diabetes. This can occur several ways, but this is common. How, how I would describe diabetes as a whole is a failure of insulin to maintain metabolic homeostasis, uh, proper fuel partitioning. And this is what happens in type 1 diabetes when uh, these folks stop producing insulin or or produce very little, kind of a lack of insulin. And then when you can produce too much insulin but still cannot reach the goal, the the basic uh, goal of insulin, proper fuel partitioning, you see the same or very similar end results. So if you if you want to combine all diabetes, then I could describe it that way. Regarding type 2 diabetes, which is, according to a later study, something like 91-92% of uh, all the people affects not, more than 91%, so by far the most important. And, and then it can be further divided into subcategories. But uh, typically, it's a problem of too much insulin, yet too little effect of this insulin. So, and then you start examining what happens and it seems that actually it's the lipid overflow that's the basic problem. So it's not glucose overflow, but lipid overflow. And why do you have lipid overflow in the body? Where should be your lipids stored? In your fat stores, in your adipose tissues. Mm -hmm. So um, type 2 diabetes is basically adipose tissue dysfunction or malfunction. So when your adipose tissue stops storing your lipids properly, And that's an interaction with insulin and other hormones, of course. Then you see the uh, outcomes and the typical symptoms, and it's directly causing uh, high blood sugars. And then there are some very nice studies which show how lipid overflow can cause uh, elevated blood sugars by stimulating the liver to produce more glucose. So how can people be... Most people are overweight with diabetes, I believe. And how can you be skinny yeah. and have Yeah, most diabetes? people are overweight, but you can find a lot of people with phenotype called TOFI, you know, thin outside and fat inside. Fat outside, and yeah. then there is even a, a more extreme phenotype that is called lipodystrophic. So when you don't have subcutaneous uh, adipose tissues, it can be actually quite a few of uh, genetic uh, problems can lead to this. So your fat cells cannot store lipids. And guess what? When your fat cells cannot store lipids, you are ripped like crazy. I mean, imagine a people without fat under their skins. They are ripped. All their veins uh, are protruding. Their their faces are usually extremely thin and so on. So what you would think, I think the last thing you would think is that they have blood sugar problems. (laughs) But they do. Actually, they are very severely insulin resistant and often diabetic. So why? I mean, they are extremely thin people. And that's, again, if you recognize that type 2 diabetes is an adipose dysfunction. So your fat cells uh, cannot store lipids properly. So these lipids flow everywhere else where they are not intended to go. That's diabetes, basically. And that's why all these uh, different phenotypes fit in, I would say, nicely. I mean, it's not nice for those people, definitely. But Mm. but from a scientific perspective, they fit in nicely. So lipodystrophy, no properly functioning fat, morbid obesity with severe insulin resistance and diabetes, not properly functioning fat. The same underlying problem, but just a different reason and different mechanism how their fat stopped properly functioning. Mm, Interesting. Do you want to talk about one more thing? 
Yeah, I think we, we didn't mention, we, uh, we failed to connect the effect of these refined foods. Uh, they also have an impact on the gut permeability, so the gut barrier function. Ah, we, we, we did mention it uh, with regard to did, yeah. not stimulating the GRP2 cells, yeah. But I think that's an extension of my presentation that I'm kind of working on it right now, that you can add this permeability effect of the same bad foods. And then you create uh, not only the hormonal imbalance, but also the necessary inflammation. So mm -hmm. you have the two underlying problems and then plausibly derived from the same poor feeding pattern. So, Interesting. So that's the next organic next uh, extension of my reading into different stuff. So... Yeah, I've been looking into the immune system, the intestinal immune system. Yeah, you know, during our talk last week, we mentioned that most people don't really understand what a beer belly is, what visceral fat is. Yeah, the fat visceral is. fat. Yeah. Yeah, talk about that. So um, most people fail to recognize that visceral fat, the, the fat within your belly is, is actually an immune organ. So it's kind of a filter between the intestinal microbiota, all the, all the bacteria and, and their metabolites, the compounds they release and your systemic circulation so that some compounds making through the intestinal barrier shouldn't reach other sensitive organs, especially your brain. And also there should be limited exposure by your liver. And there is this huge filter, which is called the mesentery, a big part of the, the visceral fat depot in humans. It's attached to the intestines all along from your stomach down to your rectum. And it's a huge filter with, with the so-called lymph nodes, the immune system basic um, uh, organ. And what happens when it swells up and you see a beer belly, it's inflamed. So there is a leaking in your gut. The bacterial stuff making it through your gut barrier is, is just overwhelming this system. So what you see and, and uh, you observe it in alcoholics, for example. And then mm -hmm. you can observe it with people eating a lot of sugar or drinking a lot of sugary drinks or in general eating just crappy foods. And mm -hmm. the, the common underlying mechanism is that alcohol and high simple sugars, these all increase the permeability of the intestines, so reduce the barrier function. And this is a very common thing. And, and this is what is associated with very poor metabolic outcomes. Most diabetics have extended visceral fat yeah. in type 2 diabetics. And that's the common pathway for alcoholics. And that's where you have a fatty liver disease. So you have an inflamed visceral fat and this extends to your liver. And when your fat cannot really hold on fat properly anymore, then this fat overflows and then you get fatty liver. And then the, the basic underlying mechanism is the same for alcoholic fatty liver and non-alcoholic fatty liver. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's again a dysfunctional adipose tissue due to this inflammation and, and the overwhelming leaking of uh, bacteria stuff through your intestinal wall. So mm, I think uh, this, is, this is the latest area of research I've been looking into. And it's fascinating and it's, it kind of complements previous research I mean, reading, uh, I'm, I'm a sofa researcher. I like to joke about it, but I'm a sofa researcher. So I, I read a lot and try to draw conclusions and then put together the pieces of the puzzle. And the next piece, a kind of organic extension of the hormonal imbalance uh, within the gut is the barrier imbalance, the barrier problem. And it can be caused by the same uh, ultra refined foods. That's the interesting thing. Yeah, well, it all ties together with the not eating the processed foods. And I love to talk about Weston A. Price. <laughs> it seems like I bring up every single episode, but he all his observational data on these cultures eating the refined flours and sugars, now it's all paying off with the science and everything you're talking about, right? Yeah, and then, and then we, we have some level of tolerance to these foods. So that's why you don't always, it's not always apparent to see that some population is deranging, for example, because we have some tolerance, but there may be some threshold, probably a little bit different threshold on an individual level. But when the proportion of these ultra refined foods is above a certain level, above this threshold, then you see this quick proliferation of obesity and diabetes and all the metabolic diseases accompanying these two. So what you see is that starting from late 70s or, or early 80s, we have this very quick expansion of ultra refined foods and obesity and diabetes. Yeah, I would say nicely follows from a scientific, but again, it uh, follows terribly closely, unfortunately.
Yeah. And I want to make the point that I used to think that when people say don't eat processed foods, you know, it's like, oh, it has preservatives in it or oh, the, these chemicals. And really, it doesn't sound like that's um, a big deal at all. I would say if you want to synthesize all these environmental things together, you can say that there is a level of endocrine disruption. So different compounds converging upon your hormonal system. So there is an endocrine disruption and some molecules in our modern environment, even air pollution can contribute to this endocrine disruption. Oh, yeah, all these so, so it, it, but, but obviously there are some factors which you cannot really do anything with. If you are living in a, in a big city, the air quality, yeah, that's it. You have to live with it or you, you can move to the farmland. But otherwise, there are some factors which are relatively easy to eliminate from your life. That's the ultra-refined foods and then all the preservatives and uh, different uh, emulsifiers and these kind of things which are also shown to be pesticides and so on and so forth. Uh, mm. These are all oh, shown to be endocrine disruptors. So they converge upon the same pathways. When they reach a critical threshold, you succumb to, to disease. And of course, some of these you can easily eliminate. And I love to say that just do so. Yeah. So what's the, to close this out, I guess we already kind of gave it up in the beginning, just eating whole foods, eating animal foods. Yeah, you, the, you told me a, a caveman check last <laughs> week. When we talked. Um, <laughs> yeah. If Imagine that you are a caveman coming out of your cave. It's a late uh, spring day, for example, or, or early autumn, fall or whatever. And you see the world around you, what you recognize as food, as a caveman, that's food. There are some exceptions, but in general, again, you should be smart about it because there is, I believe that the science is there. So you can understand the underlying mechanisms, how this works and how that works, what contribution of this kind of processing and that kind of processing has. But the most simple, the simplest thing to do is to go back to the roots and then you, have, you don't have to be smart about it. So you were saying, yeah, if you saw a wheat field, that wouldn't look like food to you. <laughs> what would look like food to you? Berries, meat? Yeah, there is, a, there is an animal running. If I can hunt it down, it's food. There, there are some roots I find, edible roots. If there are not enough animals, I, I would eat the roots as well. If, if it's season, eat the berries. But there is uh, some very interesting research coming out. I saw that at least rats uh, react differently to fruits, for example, when the daylight is long compared to when the daylight is short. Mm. So it seems that uh, out-of-season fruits is not that beneficial than in-season fruits. There is some science. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I wouldn't say that it's definitive yet. But when it also makes evolutionary sense, I'm already curious. Yeah, uh, it's. It's uh, at least I'm. I'm suspicious that it may have some merit. I think we should always look at evolution and always look at logic. And yeah, but I think we that's should... that's not really a perspective an average uh, medical doctor it has. <laughs> I would say I'm, I'm a biologist and started out as a regular biologist. So I, I studied some evolutionary biology and I'm generally interested in this field. So have, have some overview, at least have some perspective. I always consider, does it make sense from an evolutionary perspective or doesn't? But uh, mm -hmm. most medical doctors don't care about this. So they are fine with anything. They are fine with, okay, there is LDL cholesterol, which is bad. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. So that how can be anything in your body that has evolved over millions of years bad? If it had been bad, it would have been removed a long time ago yeah. by, by selection. But it's, it's obviously not bad. Or there is another option that it starts behaving bad when the environment changes so quickly that we are not able to adapt. But then the problem mm -hmm. is not with our system, but it's with the modern environment we created. The modern environment. Yeah, all the problems just come from our modern norms, I say, the way we live today. So it's pretty obvious, nothing new here that I'm <laughs> no, saying. Not but, really. uh, yeah, we just need to reject those norms. So yeah, the people who are healthy are, yeah, I'm not against vegetarian diets, right? That They're healthy because they're rejecting the norms. They're not eating processed foods, probably. They're, yeah, yeah. You know, yes, I believe that it. so, it's not because they don't eat animals, that's the, because they don't eat a lot of processed crap. 
processed foods. And then, well, I believe they should be, you know, getting those eggs or whatever. If you're pescatarian, get that fish, get some of those animal foods. But yeah, then the other side is say carnivore, keto, paleo, whatever you want to call it. They're rejecting the norms as well. And they're eating nutrient dense foods and avoiding processed foods. So really the answer is just to reject the modern norms. And I guess we can go out on that note. Do you have anywhere people can find you or should people just go on YouTube and see your presentations? Or I know you talked to Ivor Cummins a few times and he yeah, recorded I'm, some I'm, not very, I'm not very good at putting out messages or concluding on what I've been into lately, but from time to time, I do so. I've been contacted by different organizations and people. So most likely I will be on uh, some education system, giving some lectures also to medical doctors about these aspects of science. And yeah, I have a closed Facebook group called Lower Insulin can always find me there yeah I'm, I'm really not good at because you know it's it's a hobby and i love reading stuff and i'm not really good at putting out all the conclusions and reading a blog or something like that i just feel that it takes away so much time from reading i really i really yeah. love uh, reading stuff and, and playing around with the pieces of the puzzle instead of writing and telling other people what to do and, and what to understand i would like everybody to do the same just read more and write less and then we have a little bit stronger base line to start with. I like that. I try to take in a lot of information on a daily basis, but you're doing a way better job than me. You uh, had a lot of insights that I enjoyed today and thank you. And yeah, go to Lower Insulin on Facebook and join the group. And yeah, I, I know you have a lot of members in there for a while that have a lot of great discussions going on there. So if anyone's interested in all this, join it. And thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for inviting and uh, just to close it up, have a lower insulin in your body. I think that's extremely important. <laughs> I think it's the root of all of this. So let's lower insulin, guys. Yeah. See ya. All right, everyone. That's a wrap for this one. Please rate the show on the Apple Podcast app or iTunes. Share it with a friend. Say hi on social media. Eat a piece of salmon. Read a book out in the sun. Join a sports team. Make someone smile. Do some pull-ups. And come back next week. 